Hello and welcome to another episode of What Now? I know what you're thinking, especially you. Let's write a comment before watching the video person. Oh man, you're you're always there, aren't you? But yeah, what you're thinking is, hey stupid, Doom 2016 is awesome! Why you motherfucking sh eating sucker? What the hell is this doing on your show? Well, let me explain. Like stated several dozen hundred times, what happened doesn't focus exclusively on bad games at all, as seen by our LA Noir or Amalur episodes, and our Street Fighter the Movie episode, depending on who you ask. <laughs> But rather, games that have had a troubled upbringing in their youth, or developmental period. And guess what? Doom fits that bill. Oh man, does it. Because despite being one of the best games of 2016, and hell, one of the best reboots of all time, well, it had some growing pains. So, with all of us currently ripping and tearing through Eternal right now, or hugging and fishing in Animal Crossing, let us enter the gates of hell and find out what happened with Doom 2016's nine-year journey to release. Let's rewind back to the magically delicious year known as 2007, where the genre of first-person shooters is... Uh, a little bit different than it was in the 90s. This timeline placed id Software, the originators of the FPS, in a somewhat tricky position. Their last title, Doom 3, broke away from what the series was known for, white knuckle, lightning fast, demon blasting, and instead took cues from horror games and cinema, implementing a slower pace, jump scares, and featuring more story than any other id game had done before, which I'm sure some people fought against. So it's clear they were not adverse to take some risks and change things up, and while Doom 3 had its detractors, it was still a success success both critically and commercially. But the shooter landscape was changing fast, and id decided they would take inspiration from elsewhere to help guide the direction of the next Doom. A small team had begun prototyping, as most of id, and especially... The ageless organism housed inside the meat suit we call John Carmack, because its real name is unpronounceable by the human tongue. We're busy with a little thing called rage. The idea for this new Doom would see it returning to the war-torn cities of Earth, and instead of playing as, say, Flynn McTaggart or John Grimm, or even Doom Guy, you'd be in the vanilla, perfectly serviceable, and moderately priced boots of just Guy. No ancient armor, no insatiable bloodlust for demon carnage, you'd be an average Joe fighting on the side of the human resistance. In terms of gameplay, the original plan was to take some small aspects of modern shooters and apply them to the Doom setting and formula, which honestly wasn't the worst idea in the world. Now, fans of this show should know if a game is being featured on what happened, there has to be a reason for the what happened. Rage was running into several issues, both technically and of a business nature, and I don't know how many people remember this, but the original publisher was supposed to be Electronic Arts. But in 2009, that changed as ZeniMax, the parent company of Bethesda, purchased id Software outright, and Rage along with it. This, of course, disrupted the development a fair bit, as the game needed to be re-evaluated and contracts needed to be nulled and voided. Not only that, the technical problems of getting id Tech 5 up and running and Carmack's short-lived love affair with Mega Textures meant all hands were planted firmly on deck to try and make Rage a thing. It was a brand new IP and needed all the care and attention, like a newborn baby, whereas older brother Doom Eh, it will be fine, who cares? Oh, little ragey Roo, do you need help? Out of the way, you. But as it turns out, oddly enough, that Doom, let's just call it Doom 4 now, was not fine, because without any senior designers or producers guiding the project, things got hilariously off the rails. 
Call of Duty and other military shooters proved they were not a flash in the pan, but rather now ruled the shooter scene with an iron fist by 2009, outpacing things like even the mighty Halo. This resulted in the small team taking way, way, way too much influence from current trends, regenerating health, waist-high cover, reflex sights, turrets, tons of scripted story sequences, and linear levels. So it's no wonder that fans have named this version of the game Call of Doom, which was what critics inside of id had derided it as as well. Doom and Doom Eternal's co-director Marty Stratton reflected on this uh, tumultuous time in the game's teenage years. From a presentation perspective, from a story perspective, the characters and demons, it was a totally different take on those. The setting was different, the mechanics were different, and when we were making the decision to change course, we sat down to play the game and there was a lot there, honestly. It was good, like if that project had been finished, it would have been a good game, but when you'd sit down and play it, you'd say, eh, this is cool, but it just doesn't resonate Doom. It wouldn't have been what I think most people wanted out of a Doom game. And that's the key thing here, a course change, because by the time Rage was wrapping up after having several rough patches and delays of its own, having released a year after its original target of 2010, id the senior staff then turned their attention towards Doom 4, looked around, and said, what the fuck guys? While Marty's assertion that was shaping up in terms of quality aside, it was such a departure from the source material that many people at id felt it was going completely in the wrong direction, which resulted in many internal debates within the studio about where it should go. As they scratched their domes over the next few months, there was also the added tension of Rage's unspectacular debut as it didn't post the numbers or review scores that both id and Bethesda were expecting. Therefore, even more scrutiny and pressure were put on the Doom team to get the game's issues sorted. This was the studio's flagship series, so don't fuck it up. However, on October of 2011, the first public sign of trouble started to brew as Kotaku published an article citing conflict within id and stated that Doom 4, which hadn't even been announced yet, was indefinitely postponed. This was shocking because it was like, what, there's a new Doom? And then it's like, wait, wait it's cancelled? And it's this news that kinda stuck to the project almost all the way up to its release years later. It's like, oh yeah, that Doom game that had a ton of shit happened to it? Yikes, I hope that'll at least be playable. Regardless, other websites picked up the story and it became so public that it awoke Bethesda's own marketing mancubus, Pete Hines, who became repeatedly hounded by these rumors for years. Uh, we don't comment on unannounced games and Doom 4 hasn't been announced. Uh, games are done when they are done, and no title under development at id has been postponed, indefinitely or otherwise. Which wasn't 100% true. Shocking, I know. For the next several years, from 2011 to 2013, Doom languished with no real direction or release date as id were still arguing with each other about what form it should ultimately take. Is that indefinitely postponing something? If a product doesn't even have an internal release date, can it even be late? Anyway, when everyone just got sick of fighting over the thing, it was then officially decided that the whole project needed to be rebooted almost from the ground up. It was around this time that Pete, the mouth of Sauron Hines, made a revised statement to Kotaku. An earlier version of Doom did not exhibit the quality and excitement that it and Bethesda intend to deliver and that the Doom fans worldwide expect. As a result, it refocused its efforts on a new version of Doom 4 that promises to meet the very high expectations everyone has for this game and this franchise. This all occurred in 2013, which would also be an important year for another reason, one that most people claimed spelt Doom for Doom. Massive Turbo nerd John Carmack, one of id's first founders and the last one left at the company, left the company. 
Perhaps he was tired of working with Bethesda. Maybe he didn't personally like the way Doom was shaping up. Or maybe he preferred working on VR tech. Or it could have been all of the above, it most likely was. At the end of the day, it really came down to one thing. The name people most associated with Doom, alongside Romero, was no longer working on Doom. With the game still not even officially announced and one of its creators now exiting the company, fans and critics' hopes were at an all-time low. It was the next year, at QuakeCon 2014, when things finally started to take shape for the project, but unfortunately, it was still somewhat marred by odd decisions. A trailer was shown to the audience at QuakeCon, officially announcing that Doom was back and was now simply called Doom. Here is some footage of that trailer. Alright, so if you are one of the millions of fans who are not at QuakeCon, you'd have to whet your appetite by reading articles describing the footage, as this particular trailer was never released online. Like, ever. The descriptions mention high-paced action, jet packs, tons of gore, and even fatalities, which again, with no footage to put into context, might be a bit worrying to some. Now, it's fine to give event-goers an early look at something for a few hours, or days, or weeks, or even a few months, but for all the other rapid Doom fans, this didn't exactly bode well. If you're confident in your product, why not show it to the widest audience possible? Why hold back, especially when your project has had such a tumultuous development and kind of a tarnished reputation? A strange omission to be sure, as it would be another year of doubt and worry for space marines the world over. E3 2015, and Bethesda finally yanks the curtain off the game for a worldwide audience. And people were… a bit skeptical. How could they not be? One of Doom's key creators left. Id's last game wasn't all that well received, and this one was being published by Bethesda, who by 2015 had their fair share of critics. There was hope though. Wolfenstein The New Order proved to be a big success, both critically and commercially. And while some people questioned the additions to this new Doom, visually it looked great and featured the same blistering fast combat the franchise was known for. Once again, however, Bethesda, or id, whoever it was, decided to, you know, kind of quell this potential excitement with another just fucking weird decision. Once 2016 rolled around, it seemed like both developer and publisher started to push the multiplayer component rather than the story campaign. It was March when the multiplayer beta began and the feedback wasn't all that enthusiastic, with many publications comparing it to Halo in some regards. Now, while Doom has had Deathmatch in the past, it was never the franchise's focus, as id could always just rely on Quake for that. Still though, this was another worrying sign and a conveyor belt of worrying signs. And while hindsight is 2020, Bethesda probably could have allayed all fears months earlier by putting out a single player demo in lieu of an online beta. Or, I don't know, both? But we're not done, folks. There's still one more baffling aspect to this whole story and how Doom was presented and perceived by its audience and the mainstream alike. Much like when movie studios know they have some smelly turds on their hands that they want to unload as least embarrassingly as possible, early review copies of Doom were not sent out to any media outlets. For those uninitiated, this is a tactic to mitigate any potential sales damage that early reviews can cause. If there's no shiny scores or numbers for a certain game, then fans might just get impatient and go out and make an impulse purchase anyway. But when the reviews finally did start to trickle in, there was a palatable excitement in the air that the new Doom was good, great even, and somehow managed to capture what made the original game so fun and addicting, while adding just the right amount of modern influences. You were tearing through Mars, going to hell, mowing down scores of invading demons, and doing so with blood-soaked aplomb. 
So then, why all the worry, all the holding back of this beautiful carnage? It just seemed like Id or Bethesda were still unsure of where they were actually taking the game. Maybe it somehow wouldn't resonate. Therefore, they felt it best from a marketing perspective to just focus on that multiplayer and the snap map feature, which would give the game longer legs over time and keep players playing. But that didn't turn out to be the case, like, at all people began speedrunning the campaign, trying to find shortcuts and exploits, and perfecting their runs, you know, almost as if it was like a Doom game. Moreover, despite almost all of the DLC being 100% focused on that multiplayer, aside from arcade mode, the MP fell by the wayside as the months passed, with more and more people asking for story campaign DLC instead, which never really materialized. I mean, who wouldn't want more of this high-key edgelord stuff? He scoured the Umbral Plains, seeking vengeance against the Dark Lords who had wronged him. He wore the crown of the Night Sentinels, and those that tasted the bite of his sword named him the Doom Slayer. You can't top that! It's like all the creators behind this new but familiar breed of Doom were caught off guard by just how much people loved it. Expectations were fairly muted going into launch, given the game's history and shaky development, but it wasn't just a case of low expectations being exceeded. The game was really that damn good, finding an almost perfect balance between action, exploration, and story. Oh, and music, Mick, Mick Gordon's soul-shredding music. And with Eternal keeping exactly what worked from 2016, but adding some cool new tricks, weapons, and mobility, and reworking that multiplayer mode, they now seem 100% confident with what they've created. This is one of those stories where a long gestating, troubled product is actually able to beat the odds and deliver in the end, and it's one that's sadly far too rare in the video game industry. I'm so tired talking about your Duke Nukem Forever's and Anthems's and Fallout 76's, so I'm stoked to finally discuss something that has an ending where everyone mercifully gets to keep their jobs. So helmets off to you, id Software, you nailed it. Now just keep nailing it until the end of time when it comes to Doom. Rip and tear until it is done. So if you know of any other disastrous delays or massive mistakes in the video game or movie industries, shoot a rocket at the comments below or take a chainsaw to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the subject of a future episode of What Happened.